Hello. Hello. Holy crap, it's packed. I did not expect this many people for this type of talk. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Ryan Davis, and today I'm going to be talking about graphics and running simulations. I should note that despite the title, there will be no Wizard of Oz references. I'm very sorry about that, uh, but that sets a level of expectation on my graphics prowess, and I just don't have that. Uh, so something I like to do in all my talks is to set expectations up front. This is uh, about half show and tell and about half tutorial. Uh, it's got a medium level of code compared to my normal talks, uh, and it is suitable for all levels of, devel of developer. It's about 180 slides, uh, which if I give some time for Q&A at the end, uh, is about five slides a minute. But first, a little bit about me. I've been coding professionally for a long time, uh, 18 of those in Ruby. I'm the founder of Seattle.rb, the first and oldest Ruby brigade in the world. Uh, I'm the author of Minitest, Flog, Flay, uh, Ruby parser, and a whole lot of other gems. I've pushed, uh, I figured out this year that I pushed over a thousand gems into the Ruby ecosystem. Uh, I'm a developer's developer. Uh, I really like building tools that we use. Um, and I run CLRB Consulting at CLRB.com. Um, I really hate these types of slides and these talks. I'm really sorry about this, but uh, I need new clients and speaking is my primary lead generator. So what is graphics and why does it have such a boring name? Uh, I was tired of nonsensical names like Miniskirt and Nokogiri, uh, and both graphics and simulation were available, and I literally flipped a coin and wound up with graphics. Oh, hi, Aaron. Quite simply, graphics is a gem that I wrote that you can install right now. Uh, unfortunately, it's still in beta, so you have to use dash dash pre. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try to fix that today. Uh, it tries to provide a simple framework uh, to implement simulations, which I'll leave open-ended at this point, digital art, custom visualizations, and even games. Uh, it's designed to follow grade school mathematical conventions, not game programming conventions, and I'll get more into this later. So I want to demystify graphical programming, generative art, simulation, scientific visualization, simple games. I want to show that these topics aren't actually hard. Perhaps most importantly, though, I want to add a new tool to your toolbox so you can use it to add an extra dimension to your work or to understand a problem that you're having. But first, a simple word of warning. I am not good at art or graphical programming. I'm aesthetically challenged, especially in electronic mediums. Look at my website for proof. I don't have the strongest math background, especially in linear algebra and other maths heavily used in graphics. I'm not a scientist. And I'm not a game dev. Uh, I will never write the next version of Doom. This makes me a perfect candidate to try to write a graphics framework for the rest of us. Because I'm damn good at making tools to help me and other developers out. So I've made this gem to be as useful and as powerful as possible, while at the same time to be as simple as I can possibly get it. But I prefer real examples over theory and marketing fluff, so let's quickly get concrete with a real and tangible example. Let's start with a blank window. This is all it takes. You require graphics. You create a new class, and you subclass graphics colon colon simulation, where G colon colon S is just slide shorthand because uh, nothing fit in this talk. Um, in the case of these talks, I'm going to be including uh, white background in all the classes because I wasn't quite sure how good the throw was going to be on the projector, and you know, a thin line on black might not come through. Um, and you instantiate it, and you tell it to run. You wind up with a blank canvas that is defaulting to half the width and height of your actual screen. To actually draw something, we had a draw method. We call super, and then we declare a circle in the middle of the window with a radius of 15. We tell it to be blue and filled. Uh, you see a circle, but there's no state or behavior with this setup. For that, I want to make this a bit more complex. I declare a body subclass called ball, and in that, I declare count to be zero, or sorry, one, and then I create a class called view with a draw class method that takes the window and the ball to draw. The drawing code uses uh, b.x and b.y, but is otherwise very similar. Uh, then we get rid of the original draw method. Then, back in simulation, I add an initializer and I declare that ball is going to be used by calling register bodies with the result of populate ball. It's not too much different. Everything's just been displaced a little bit. This allows for state and behavior. And this is when things start to get interesting. 
We can add an initializer to ball, call super, and then set both the angle and magnitude to random values. The x and y of the body is already random via the super. Now to add behavior, I want an update method to ball. Is that running? Interesting, it is running, but it's not showing on my screen, so I need to stop looking at my screen. Um, for now, we're gonna tell it to move and then wrap around as if necessary. This is similar to how the classic game Asteroids works. If we change from wrap to bounce zero, where zero means no friction, then we're gonna get behavior that's similar to the classic game Pong. And if we added a small down vector to the ball's velocity and bounced with a default friction, in other words, no zero, then we simulate how a real ball would bounce. We've got three very different behaviors with three very small changes. Finally, a simple one line change from count equals one to count equals 25 makes this much more interesting dynamic example. So we've got a simulation class, declares a white background, declares that ball should be used, that's all it does. We've got a, ball, uh, a body named ball, populate should make 25 balls in the simulation, uh, we have a gravity constant, some random setup, and very basic behavior of balls bouncing under constant gravity. And finally, ball declares a view class that defines how to draw a ball in a stateless manner. 28 lines of code in the end. It only looks complex because I split it across three slides to make this readable. Here it is in its entirety, only barely formatted to fit on the, on the slide, and it's not too bad in my opinion. Uh, it really, truly easy enough that anyone can do it. So they gave you an idea of what graphics programming looks like with the graphics gem, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. Let's look at more. Let's start with generative art. Here's crisscrossing lines with random jitter added to their XYs. They're very, very lightly colored, translucent black, but there's 300 of them, so they quickly become solid dark black. This is the exact same code with slightly tweaked behavior. Instead of crisscrossing the lines, each segment is jittered away from the previous. This creates a, a fountain or jet effect. This is a complex wave pattern. Uh, what's cool is that this is not 3D math. It's actually really simple underneath. It's just uh, emergent behavior looks 3D. Uh, this is contributed by Josh Cheek, who's been po uh, posting amazing videos uh, using graphics, and he's got a lot more graphical skill than I do. Here's another piece by Josh Cheek. Uh, I just can't get over what he's done with the graphics gem. It, it kills me. Uh, his are set to music. Mine are not, uh, sorry. Uh, this is an em emulation of Piet Mondrian's artwork with animations added, which we'll see more of later. And finally, I went to an art exhibit a couple months back uh, where several of the pieces actually showed their maths. And so I took a picture of this one and I translated it to Ruby. It's only 42 lines of code. God, I love that. <clears throat> so let's look at some more math-oriented examples. Uh, I hope this reads, oh, it reads fine, that's great. Uh, this is a very simple proof of concept that you could implement the logo programming system in Ruby. Uh, this is taking a terminal input uh, to a drawing turtle to draw a square. And this is a standard fractal tree. This one was contributed by Justin Collins. This is a simple visualization of quadrant one mass with a polynomial. Nothing special, really simple. And this, also reads really well. This projector is fantastic, I wanna buy one. Um, this simulates bouncing balls expanding a polygon to calculate the value of pi. It's hard to see what the, the current estimate of pi is up in the Windows title, uh, but it only gets to 3.13 by the time the, the video loops. <clears throat> it does hit 3.14 at some point. Uh, now the part that fascinates me the most, simulations. Um, here's a more complete version of the bouncing balls example that I gave before. Two very different versions of Conway's Game of Life. Boyd's or a flocking simulation, which we'll see more of later. Two different versions of fluid dynamic simulations, and these use, uh, they're, they're the same maths entirely, but they use different visualizations to show the current density. Um, uh, a color gamut is being used on the right, and then you can see little spheres as they hit the bottom uh, and the density grows. <clears throat> Canvas drawing of the, the Vance or virtual ants algorithm, which we'll see more of later. This might be a little hard to see, but this is many, oh no, it looks great. I need to stop saying that. Uh, many randomly moving bodies with uh, collision detection and handling, uh, trails so you can see their paths, 
and random goal-changing behavior. And the reason why I got into this in the first place, uh, I wanted to write a zombie outbreak epidemic simulator. Uh, this shows one of the very few cases where the priests win and kill all the zombies. And while it isn't an explicit goal of the gem, it is totally possible to implement games. Uh, this example shows the use of collision maps and sprites. This is a vector-based tank that is driven by the user, poorly because I'm driving it. This is a bitmap version with slightly more sophisticated uh, implementation. Um, this is where I started to switch to the, the model view controller setup that I showed you before. Uh, it even has pew pew noises when you shoot. Uh, this shows user interaction using the mouse. And finally, uh, random maze generation using James Buck's uh, Mazes for Programmers book. He gave a really good talk in Salt Lake a couple years back and I was enthused by it so I implemented it during his talk. So, graphics. I'd like to take a moment to talk about how graphics feels different to me to emphasize my goals that I've been uh, working on uh, while I've been working on this. I want to optimize this to be approachable. I want to ideally target workshops for beginners, uh, other non-computer science-y folk, and other non-game devs. I want this to be under, uh, undemanding and easy to install. Um, there are platform-specific external dependencies, and I'm sorry for that, um, but it's the only thing that makes this performant. Uh, I want the graphics gem to be a single gem install and work like any other gem. I've removed and normalized as much as I can to make it usable to anyone with any background. It is optimized to get to first pixels as quickly as possible, to see your code with as little boilerplate as possible. Getting new developers quick and easy feedback is very empowering. And while there's no in-process editing yet, uh, single file is all it takes to experiment. It's simply a matter of edit and run. I want this to be any other script. I don't want it to be an app, a la Rails, or other large frameworks. Wherever possible, graphics uses real maths. Uh, unless you need to use the computer's built-in trig functions, uh, which are always specified in radians, uh, everything in graphics uses degrees. It uses quadrant one maths, just like you used in grade school. Uh, unlike game math coordinates, which looks like quadrant four, but for some reason, Y is still positive, even though it's going down. Uh, it uses the right-hand rule, where zero degrees is to the east, 90 to the north, et cetera. Again, just like grade school. These allow simple things to work as expected. Uh, it means that all the stuff that you were taught in grade school still works as intended. It makes one less thing that you have to adjust in your brain when implementing your simulation. And graphics is opinionated. It wants to be pretty. Uh, there are over 20 graphic primitives available uh, in graphics with more to come. Everything is anti-aliased by default. Alpha blending is automatic based on the color that you're drawing. And there are plenty of helpers to make your code as clean as possible. Probably more to come. So let's start to talk about how this works. First, we'll talk about the update and draw loop. At the highest level possible, we have a model, which is the state of your simulation. Each turn that gets drawn or rendered into a canvas, and that in turn gets copied to the actual screen. As such, our loop is really just three calls. Update, or change the model for this turn. Draw, which renders the model onto a canvas. Present, finally copy that canvas to the screen. As an aside, this is what I want things to feel like. On every turn, you have a new blank canvas, you draw some things, then you copy them to the screen. Under the covers, there might be two or more of those canvases and they take turns updating and copying to the screen. These are details you don't really need to know most of the time, but they can trip you up on occasion. There's other stuff involved, but the basic run loop works just like this. Update n times, where n is usually one. Draw, then render to the screen. Update by default tells all registered bodies to update themselves. The default draw phase clears the canvas, then tells each registered body to render itself via that body's view class. It's a bit more than this, but this is the gist. And finally, the render phase calls down to the lower layers of the graphics engine to do the stuff and make it actually display on the screen. There's a very basic class hierarchy. Abstract simulation has nearly all the meat in it. If anything, I should just rename it to simulation. Graphics simulation is the class you're gonna use 80% of the time in the end. It has all the normal functionality that I've described so far. If anything you do changes over time, this is probably the class that you want to start with. 
On each turn, it clears the window by default, and it uses very smooth drawing, and by that I mean it uses that double buffering under the covers. The other 20% of the time, you might want to use graphics drawing. It does not clear the canvas on each turn, and it uses a single canvas that is persistent throughout all turns, and it uses single buffered drawing from that one canvas. It's static, so it's meant to draw things that are either entirely static at the start, they never change, or they're additive over time. This makes it good for plots and simulations or art where the canvas itself is part of the state. Okay, that's well and good, but what can you actually do? Uh, how do you draw things? Let's look at each one. Uh, for the sake of making these slides readable, I've defined these following values and methods uh, to use in the examples. Uh, we have a default margin of 50, random X and Y, a random color from all the registered colors that it defaults to have, uh, a random bool which you you won't really tell, but I've biased it towards false. Um, and for things that need multiple different values, I've got a R50 method that just gets a random 50. So clear, not much to say here. Uh, first thing we almost always want to do on each turn is to clear the screen, but this happens by default when you use simulation. Point is the most basic building block, but not necessarily something you're gonna directly use a lot. Uh, here we're making a thousand random points uh, on each turn with random colors, and it just basically becomes this Noise. Line is pretty straightforward as well, with two pairs of XY values and a color. Here we're using the window height and the current turn number to animate. Angles like line, but you specify a single XY and then an angle and length instead of a second point. H line and V line take one coordinate and then span the whole window with your specified color. This is useful for plotting stuff. Aaron. Do not airdrop me during the talk. <laughs> I don't even have a mouse right now, you jackass. <clears throat> Circle takes a middle point and a, and a radius. Uh, this is the first primitive with an area, so it also takes a Boolean declaring whether or not it's filled. Ellipse is just like circle, but it takes two radius values. Fast rect is a filled rect, always filled, taking an origin point on the bottom left, a width and a height and a color. It uses the lower level drawing function that should be faster, uh, but these days it probably isn't anymore because everything is terribly fast. Too fast, in fact. I had to add uh, vsync to make things viewable. Uh, rect is the same thing as filled rect, but it also takes a Boolean for whether or not it's filled. Polygon takes any number of points in a color. Uh, I probably need to extend this to allow for a filled polygon, but no one's asked for that yet, so thanks. And I always feel conflicted about this one. Um, Bezier allows you to draw curves, but not in a terribly approachable way. You kind of need to be more of a graphics dev for this. Uh, I'm not gonna explain this one too much. Uh, I wanna add splines or something else that I find easier to use. Okay, this one's busy. It's one of the busiest slides I've got. Um, sprite, that call up top, takes dimensions and a block. During the block execution, drawing goes into a separate canvas and that image is returned. Blit takes that image, or any image, and draws it at a location with an angle and possibly uh, optionally scale. Instead of using sprite to create a canvas, you can call image to load a bitmap from a file instead. Render text takes a string, a color, an optional font, there's always a default font, and returns an image. Put is just like blit, except that it uses the bottom left corner instead of the center as its origin. Here you can see it rotating on that corner, unlike the tank and turret from before. Text renders, this has been opened, uh, and draws a string at the specified point with a specified color. Okay. Um, finally, there's some helper functions that render to the screen. FPS prints the frames per second. It's a bad estimate, but it's close enough. Mouse returns the mouse state, and I use that with uh, the debug function that takes a format string and arguments to it and prints it. For debugging at the pixel level or just for fun, you can save a PNG of the current screen. Uh, and that's it. So let's build up some real examples, starting with generative art. Um, I throw pottery. I enjoy it. Uh, it's fun to struggle with. Uh, I don't feel the same way about computer art. Uh, it's a struggle for me, and I don't find that struggle fun. So I had an interview a few months back where they asked me to generate art in the style of Piet Mondrian. 
Uh, I don't have time to go on about Mondrian. Uh, I could do that for a long time, but you should check out his work. It's really good. So normally I'd start with a hand-drawn sketch of what we're going for, but here we actually have a finished product to emulate. This is his actual work. So we start where we always start, with a blank canvas. Uh, I've added a grid to help visualize where we want to go. Uh, there's stuff here I won't explain. It's mostly to make the slides more readable. Let's focus on the art method. So let's just think about where we want to go. We want thick lines that span the window. So we always have the width and height of the window, so let's just put two down. First vertically at 120, and next horizontally at 80. And W is the value 20, which is the width of the lines that we're gonna make. Next, let's use some helpers to generate a random number of grid-aligned X's and Y's, and then draw them using the previous code. It's really not much different except there's some loops. Uh, this looks good. Now we just need to fill in some regions. Uh, and as an aside, I just wanna say, like, I love the fact that in Ruby, RAN could take number ranges. Uh, it makes code so much prettier than the way we have used to do this shit in C. Offsets and adding and all that crap. Um, so this is gross, I admit. Um, I have pulled it out in our zone method for this slide. Basically, we randomly pick some regions based on the X's and Y's that were previously generated. And then we find the area of those regions and we fill with a random primary color. What is going on next door? That's amazing. <laughs> I, I hope this comes through on the audio for the recording. Honestly, that's not bad. Uh, and yet, they still didn't offer me the job. Um, nor did they offer me any feedback on how I could improve. So I wrote a blog post about it and published their interview question. NRI, you should treat your interviewees better. Okay, slightly more relevant to your job. Let's work out some basic data visualization. Let's say you have a lot of data. You don't know what that data means yet. Uh, and this is a bit of a bullshit example, uh, but gathering data and plotting something like message size over time spent to process. As Rubyists, we're incredibly good at gathering data, whether that's parsing it out of text or slurping it from a database or whatever. Uh, getting the data is never a real problem that we've ever had. So I'm not gonna touch how that data is gathered. Just assume that I have it. And looking at a million data points, just under a million data points, uh, and poking at it uh, the way we would normally poke at it uh, doesn't help. Uh, we, need to make, we need a way to make some sense of it. One way might be to visualize it and see if there's a visible correlation. But doing something with that data, something visual, what do we as Rubyists do? Normally at this point, someone would probably suggest grabbing a whole new language like R. It's very good at importing and manipulating data, but it's also a pain in the ass language and overkill if you're not doing a lot of real stats. Or maybe someone else suggests using Excel. It has great plotting capabilities, but the data that you're dealing with is really, really big and getting it into a spreadsheet is a pain. Now you have two problems. We don't have many good options in Ruby for this. We grab for tools in other languages like R or uh, D3 in JavaScript. Uh, and that keeps us from improving our own tooling. I think that's a problem, so let's try to address this a bit. I'm not solving this problem, I'm just addressing it. So let's try to do this ourselves, playing to our strengths. We always start with a sketch of our system. That didn't come through very well, but whatever. Basically, we're gonna do a very basic plot trying to show time over size to see where any problems might be. When I say sketch, I mean it. This is why this is hand-drawn. So as usual, we start with a very basic subclass of simulation to make a blank window. Uh, this time I've declared a grid to help. Let's change initialize to store off the data being passed in. We scale it to the size of the window, which uh, is max, which is set to 500. Then we use group by to gather and count the same values uh, and we apply math log to keep the values sane. Otherwise, everything is just a big black screen. So now we can add the draw method. We simply walk over the data. We plot a gray point at x, y, but I also plot a translucent red circle at that point with the log uh, count as the radius. Uh, this will start to show where there's lots of spillover. If you zoom in, you can see that there's very light red is heavily spilling over in some areas. Uh, these are areas where you might want to look for trouble. There's a huge amount of variance in those columns. Uh, now we know where to look. Have fun with it. Add features. Label those axes. Put the values in there. Uh, make it easier to repeat later. 
This might not be the right data to visualize, though, or it might not be the right way to visualize it. You need to experiment in order to suss out information from raw data. Running simulations is why I wrote this library. Here are some simple examples on how to do that. Langston's ants, or vants, which is short for virtual ants, they live on a 2D plane and have a simple set of rules that they execute every turn. If an ant is on a white cell, make it black, turn left. If not, make it white, turn right. Move forward one and repeat for all ants. Turns out they're Turing complete. They're a Turing machine on a 2D surface where their state is their current position as well as direction. This is what it looks like for a single ant after about 11,000 iterations of this rule. As always, we start with a blank canvas. I'm leaving some of the mechanics out for brevity, but otherwise it looks the same. This reads pretty much like the rules. If it's white, set it black, turn left. If it's black, set it white, turn right. Finally, move. And here it is after only a few turns. This is it after about 6,000 iterations. Not bad ant farm. I really like it. Boyd's is an artificial life program which simulates the flocking behavior of birds, fish, or other systems. Wikipedia, I love the fact that Wikipedia says this, incidentally, Boyd is also a New York metropolitan dialect pronunciation for bird. <laughs> <clears throat> Boyd's use a combination of simple rules to determine flocking behavior. At a minimum, it has cohesion, separation, and alignment. But more can be added, uh, you can also have more added forces like wind or water uh, for a more accurate simulation for whatever you're doing. We get off to the usual start. We declare a simulation with a white background and an FPS display, because uh, it was really slow to start, uh, and then register the Boyd body to be used. We'll have 25 Boyds, and we'll initialize them with a random angle and speed. We'll declare that they get drawn as a simple black circle with a red line showing their vector. Boyds try to fly towards the center, or rule number one, cohesion. Boyds try to fly towards the center mass of nearby Boyds. That's pretty much exactly what this code says. Calculate the center mass, find the difference, and return 1% of that. Rule number two, separation. Boyds try to keep a small distance away from others. This involves finding nearby Boyds that are too close and calculating a vector slightly away from them. Rule number three, alignment. Boyds try to match the velocity of their nearby Boyds this simply involves calculating the difference of the average velocity with their own. Now, each turn is just a matter of summing those vectors uh, and adding them to the current velocity clamped to a limit. Finally, at the bottom, we move and wrap around the window. And here's the final result. Very quickly, the flocking behavior takes over and they converge while maintaining safe distance from each other. Simple rules add up to very organic feeling behavior. And finally, games. Let's dissect that tank game from the gallery. I'm not gonna implement the whole thing here for time, uh, but I wanna show how to do interactivity. Of course, we start with a sketch of what we're gonna do, nothing fancy, uh, just a simple tank with an independent turret in an arena. So we sketch that up. And we formulate the rules for how we want it to behave. For now, the tank is in the arena. Um, arrows let us move the tank, A and S, turn the turret, everything else, firing, et cetera, is an exercise for the viewer. As always, we start with a blank canvas. We initialize the tank to be in the middle. Uh, we have to add a turret for an angle independent of the body angle. Next, we draw our tank into a sprite. Uh, pro tip, um, this is incredibly error prone. Um, so give each shape a different color until you figure all the coordinates out. Uh, draw extra boundaries around the whole thing and draw diagonals to help you measure on stuff. Little things like that help a lot. And then we use Blit to put the tank and the turret on the canvas. Uh, at this point, the game will start up and you can see the tank just sitting in the middle. Well, that's boring, because it can't do anything. So let's give the tank some behavior. The ability to turn the body and the turret and to move uh, to accelerate or deaccelerate. Then once that's working correctly, we can go ahead and plug in those event handlers uh, using add key handler. We declare the handlers and have them control the state of the tank. And here's our final result, uh, for this talk at least. Um, obviously this can be easily extended to fire bullets, uh, have sound effects, multiple tanks, targets, scoring, et cetera. 
I just can't fit all of that into this talk. Sorry. So what are the patterns that we've seen so far? Start with a sketch. Figure out what you want to see. Figure out the behavior rules, if any. Start coding with a blank canvas and build up one small thing at a time. Don't try to do the whole thing at once. This is too much stuff. If you aren't sure, start experimenting with drawing. Get your images, your sprites, your, your backgrounds, everything right. Uh, move to simulation when you have more dynamic behavior. MVC is fantastic here. Uh, model, mostly body instances. Your view is all bodies have an external draw routine, stateless. Uh, and controller, simulation, running uh, update and draw loop and maintaining the shared state. I think the declarative form works really well for graphical programming. So try to push towards doing less in your methods and using decorator modules instead. Just remember to always call super, otherwise they don't show up. Hopefully, this talk has convinced you that you could benefit from added visualization tool in your toolbox and that graphics is a good fit for that. Thank you. The question is what lies underneath and yes, it is a C library, it's called libsdl and uh, the unreleased version of this code which is eminent uh, has switched from, switched, shut up, switched from SDL1 to SDL2, which is why it's so much more performant than it used to be. Uh, and, and it is now like pixel perfect colors, really good alpha blending, like it's really improved. Is it possible to do this for MRuby? I don't see why not, I don't know. Um, but I'm gonna say yes. I mean this, is, this, this, this has a small c extension in it which provides the wrapper to SDL and so it should be just the same. What are the limitations that I currently see with it? I don't think there's enough decorators. I don't think there's enough drawing primitives. Um, uh, Josh uh, Cheek uses this a lot and he's asked for things like thick lines instead of having to do it yourself, um, which uh, is now possible with my switch to SDL2. Um, the performance problems went away. I went from 30-ish frames a second to 200 frames a second by switching to SDL2 and so I actually had to slow it down uh, otherwise, the simulations are gone before you can see anything. Um, and, the, and all the coloring stuff is better. Oh, uh, another thing that I don't like, um, and I don't have an example of this in this talk, uh, I hate eyeballs and I hate brains. Color perception is really, really complex and difficult. Uh, it turns out magenta is not a real color and that, that crazy wacky thing called brightness is really complex. So if you're wanting to do scientific visualizations where you're using, um, where you're wanting to use the same level of intensity for your colors uh, to differentiate, that's exceedingly hard. Uh, if you use uh, the color system called HSV, hue saturation value, that supposedly lets you walk across the hues with the same saturation and value, but blue's darker than red and yellow and they all have the same saturation and value. And so you wind up with these extremely different versions of, of intensity. Um, there is a color map, uh, HCL, that uh, tries to address color perception differences. Uh, it also means that as you're walking through the hue, some of those colors don't exist because they don't match the intensity. Um, so you wind up with nil values and you wind up screwing up your thing. So I, I need to figure out how to address that. Uh, I don't know if I can. I hope I can, but I don't know. I'm still experimenting. I don't know if I understand your question. It, what do I suggest to tests in what? Okay, so what tests would I write while I'm doing one of these things? Um, absolutely test the crap out of your models. Uh, you don't have to test emergent behavior that will fall out on its own and I, I don't think that's something you need to write a test for. Um, so I would test all of my models um, head to toe and then I would probably leave it at that. Um, the, the way the controller works and the way the view code works, like I wouldn't write a test for the view method at all. 
Um, if I did, it would probably be save off a bitmap and try to compare against a golden, but I hate golden tests. Um, and then the controller, for the most part, is entirely declarative, and I don't see the value in, declar in testing most declarative code. Can you do this headless? Yeah. Um, Totally. Uh, no, but I've been very, simulation's still available, so I've been very seriously considering splitting the graphics stuff out to just graphics and having simulation being a separate gem so you can just do uh, numeric stuff. Um, uh oh, I'm at yellow. Um, yeah, so like there's a, there's a logging uh, function in there where you can register a logger to, to run every 100 ticks or whatever. Uh, and it would be really easy just to not create a window at all and have that go and, and have your, your, your routine do the update loop and log loop instead of an update and draw. Uh, I haven't broken that out yet, but it would be 10 lines of code to do it. You change the initializer around to not do the, the window and have everything else be the same. Uh, and I can totally add that. Question is, is it possible to add new primitives if you don't mind coding in C, it's totally possible. Um, I'm using uh, SDLGFX as uh, an extender of the standard primitives available, and I've wrapped all but 15 of them. Uh, I'm switching from SGE to GFX, and I haven't wrapped everything yet, so I'm gonna get thick lines soon, and I'm gonna get some other stuff. Um, the problem is that SGE also provided my collision detection bitmap comparator, um, uh oh, oh, I got 30 more seconds according to that. Um, and I just haven't finished that. Uh, but I mean, if, if your primitives were done at the Ruby level, then yeah, it's just another method that you just throw into simulation. All the demos were just done in, uh, so the question is do I have other backgrounds? Um, it defaults to black, the, the white decorator's there, and I used it in all these slides because I was worried that I was gonna have a bright room and a, a dim projector. Um, but you can clear in any color you want. You can also uh, blit a texture onto the background as well if you wanted to do like a game. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that's all the time we have, so thank you very much.